My name is Jeremy Cohen. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of SPY, um, the head of the analytic uh, social psychology group, and uh, one of the organizers of the conference. And thank you for being here uh, this evening. Um, I'm not going to say very much to open this, um, except, uh, first of all, since this is our last official event of the evening, to thank um, the, uh, first of all, the volunteers who actually made the thing run this weekend. Um, so maybe we can give them a hand. Um, and thank the other organizers except for me, because thanking myself would not be. Um, but uh, thank you to everybody else who organized the conference. Um, okay, so I'm not going to say much in the way of opening remarks here. Um, I'll just uh, read the panel description and take us away for our uh, great panelists coming up. But I will say, just briefly, like a, a few reflections I've had uh, this weekend um, and listening to the things uh, coming up at the conference. I think that, you know, fundamentally, uh, several times I've actually heard how much like psychoanalysis has to fight um, at this point. Uh, the word fight has come up, that there are sort of battles to be fought and to be won. And it seems to me that, you know, what sort of the, the organizing thematics behind the conference to some degree and something I've been happy to sort of see manifested in the kinds of conversations and the vitality of the discussions that have been going on is that really like the psychoanalysis's fight, such as it is, is really not about psychoanalysis. It's about broader fights for, um, more or less for humanity, like for the future of self-reflection, for the future of the individual, um, for the future of uh, just society, um, and that these questions, the, this broad transformation um, in ourselves and this broad preservation necessary in the face of some of coming dark forces, um, or present dark forces, is the, the motivating uh, impetus behind my reason for psychoanalysis, my reason for thinking about the subject. Um, I'm not planning to be a professional psychoanalyst. I appreciate my analyst in New York and those of us here who are. Um, but I think the, the fundamental questions here have been about psychoanalysis as a key part of the broader human conversations of our moment. Um, and if that's right, that's sort of the sort of gamut of what we've been trying to do here. And uh, I think it's up to us to consider as the weekend, you know, fades in memory and to think about, like, have we been right? Like, is this the gamut? Is psychoanalysis and its ideas and its practices capable of helping us in a profound and sharp way pose the problems of our moment? Um, and so I want to thank everybody who's come and participated for uh, helping me do that. And, you know, posing that challenge to me as well. Uh, okay, so, sort of, again, to consider uh, that question, um, we have our final plenary of the evening, uh, of the weekend, which is uh, called Psychoanalysis on the Far Side of the 20th Century. And I'm just going to read really quickly the description. Uh, Each generation inherits a new past. Today, psychoanalysis is fading fast. That rhymes. <laughs> Classroom instructors savage it. The latest scientific psychology is rejected. Analysts themselves struggle to attract new patients and trainees. Freud remains universally hailed as one of the defining minds of the 20th century, yet nobody knows exactly what this means. Since psychoanalysis defines who we have come to be, how are we to define it? A revolutionary science of mind? A new basis for critical thinking about history and society? A form of therapeutic practice? A new sexual morality? A general theory of human nature? A practice of self-understanding, a dominant medical paradigm, a hermeneutic key to culture, a tendentious, pseudo-scientific, and dangerous ideology? How can psychoanalysis make sense of this tangled history? What made psychoanalysis a powerful articulation of self and society? Was it bound to historical configurations that have since passed? How does psychoanalysis appear, uh, the self, society, science, and psychology of today. Can psychoanalytic ideas have comprehensive range and force in the new century? Why should they? And uh, we're privileged, I'm going to just sort of introduce our panelists as we go. Um, we're privileged to have, starting us off, uh, Dr. Uh, Prudence Gorbachev, uh, who's a past president of the American Psychoanalytic Association, 
where she created a university outreach program and the Service Members and Veterans Initiative, and currently heads the Social Issues Department. She practices uh, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, and organizational consultation in Chicago, where she serves on the faculty of the Institute for Psychoanalysis. Her interests include the application of psychoanalytic ideas to social issues and the role of psycho uh, psychoanalysts as public intellectuals. Uh, she's writing a book right now on changing her mind. <laughs> Thank you. Is this uh, on? Um, it's an incredible pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for uh, the conference and the society for this um, opportunity, which has very um, significant personal meaning to me. Some years ago, it occurred to me that if psychoanalysis, as, as I know it and love it, were to have a future, it depended on our um, psychoanalysts making contact with undergraduates. And um, this led to a project we called the 10,000 Minds Project, where the goal was just to acquaint undergraduates with the existence of psychoanalysis, um, which the University of Chicago does a pretty good job of, but uh, other universities is not that common. And this led to an education department where we have committees at the American Psycholytic Association doing outreach and forging links to educational entities at every level of education from pre-K to the academy. Um, so speaking here today for me is really the realization of a long-standing hope related to the future of the field. Um, impressively, the conference organizers have raised, I think, every relevant question anyone could possibly think of. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm going to narrow my comments down to two, primarily one, which is, can psychoanalytic ideas have range and force in the 21st century? Why should they? And I'll also touch on the issue of splits within psychoanalytics with us, different schisms, schools of thought. Um, I speak from the perspective of 30 years of practice as a clinical psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And my immersion in clinical practice has overlapped with 15 years work as a psychoanalytic politician and organizational leader. Most recently, I've articulated a role for psychoanalysis in social advocacy and social commentary, and I've tried to put that perspective into practice. In my organizational roles, I've been intent on doing what I could to ensure the survival and the continued relevance of the field. So I've been deeply committed in a very practical way to the idea that psychoanalysis has a future and is, will be relevant in the future. My general attitude has been that if we have survived as a profession after doing so much to shoot ourselves in our metaphorical feet, we must have something valuable to offer. <laughs> I know I'm not alone in my conviction that psychoanalysis remains the deepest, most comprehensive, and most generative theory for attacking the eternally perplexing question, why do people do what they do? And its sibling questions, how do people come to be who they are, and how in the world can we get them to change? <laughs> I've done quite a bit of uh, writing and talking in the public sphere using psychoanalytic ideas. I have a conviction that the average clinical psychoanalyst can, if she tries, have something interesting to add to a conversation about just about anything human. If we can't say, find something useful to say, we're not trying hard enough. We're not making our rightful contribution. Though they preoccupy many of my colleagues, although I haven't heard uh, much uh, focus on this today, which is nice. I don't worry too much about schisms and intellectual splits within the field, either in my clinical work or in my public writing and speaking. But I want to briefly address this question. My psychoanalysis, both uh, the theory and practice I use in my office and the psychoanalysis I take out into the public space is organized around what I see as a handful of incredibly useful and durable ideas. For me, these are the unconscious, transference, resistance, defense and conflict, development, and the healing potential of relationship, connection, and narrative. As far as I'm concerned, any theory that is in love with these ideas or dependent on them is psychoanalysis, and any theory that abandons them risks being something else. 
To my mind, the well-known psychoanalytic schools all employ these ideas to one extent or another, although they emphasize and define them in different ways. That doesn't concern me. By nature, I'm a passionate lumper, not a splitter. I'm personally allergic to factions and schools, and I'm drawn to integration, eclecticism, and impurity of theory. In my clinical work and my intellectual efforts, I use any psychoanalytic idea that is explanatory or organizing for me in the moment. And I comfortably move between ideas that are cohesion, classical, object relational, Kleinian, Kleinian developmental, and neurological, and I also use uh, my basic psychiatry training. But I believe there's value in the distinct theoretical schools in the field, though I leave it to others to be true believers. The passionate adherence of a particular school of psychoanalytic thought push ideas forward in new and radical directions. They move theory into the future. And they create more food for psychoanalytic omnivores like me, who shamelessly borrow ideas from those who have thought wars about the finer points and distinctions. Now let me move to the topic of the psychoanalyst as public intellectual. The way I see the future of psychoanalysis, Psychoanalysts must take our handful of great ideas into the public arena and show that they work. We need to demonstrate how their footprint can be seen in public policy, economics, child rearing, politics, marketing, entertainment, fine arts, and popular culture. I think it's interesting that our culture today combines a relative lack of interest in depth psychology with an obsession with psychological explanations and perspectives. To give one example, I subscribe, for reasons I won't go into, to the Harvard Business Review newsletter. And I would estimate, that it comes into my uh, email inbox every day, I would estimate that three quarters of the articles in the Harvard Business Review newsletter are about psychological themes and the psychology of business relationships. Op-ed writers, cable news commentators, and bloggers are constantly looking for psychological explanations of what people do. But just like psychotherapy without a psychoanalytic grounding, these incessant conversations become repetitive and formulaic. The psychoanalyst immersion in the world of the unconscious, transference, resistance, and fractured development gives him access to explanatory ideas that pop up when other observers are stopped, unable to find specific or useful explanations for some social phenomena or issue. Additionally, the psychoanalyst training in uncommon data collection <coughs> techniques, such as empathic listening and free-floating attention, proves enormously useful in listening to broader social groups and discerning unconscious themes. Certainly, other fields have embraced the irrational and unpredictable. Behavioral economics, for example, has famously introduced the irrational into economic theory. But it is not enough to say people are irrational. Psychoanalysis can break down the irrational into components such as fantasy, anxiety, fixation, and defense. Here's a wonderful example, in my opinion, of the use of psychoanalysis in the public sphere. British psychoanalyst Sally Weintraub, Weintraub and a group of colleagues at the London Psychoanalytic Institute developed what she calls a psychoanalytic intervention to address climate change denial. Weintraub's group began with a series of public lectures conducted under the auspices of a program which I admire enormously called Beyond the Couch. This is a program of the London Psychoanalytic Institute. Uh, the public lectures um, led to a book engaging with climate change, psychoanalytic and interdisciplinary perspectives. The foreword to the book is written by a British climate scientist, not a psychoanalyst, a climate scientist. Uh, named Chris Rapley, and his words are telling. Um, if we listen carefully to what uh, Rapley says, I think the direction of our future is clear. Here, here's his words from the foreword. To the climate scientist, bemused by the failure of the widely held but flawed, quote, information deficit, unquote, model, in which non-experts are empty vessels, will respond appropriately once informed of the facts, it is a revelation and relief to discover that the sequence of denial is all too familiar 
to those who deal with the workings of the human mind. In November of 2012, Renee Lertzman, one of the members of Weintraub's group, delivered a lecture uh, sponsored by the Energy Unit at the University College London. Like, uh, Lertzman explained the importance and usefulness of a psychoanalytic perspective in communicating to the public about climate change denial. And this is, if you know any environmental scientists, this is a, a huge issue. Uh, I have some young friends who just graduated from an environmental science school with a master's, and they have whole courses in trying to communicate uh, their, the facts so that the public will pay attention. Um, so, Dr. Lertzman gave a lecture to the uh, energy unit at University College London, and he, um, he was explaining the usefulness of psychoanalytic ideas. 350 climate scientists, human geographers, and meteorologists attended the lecture. This is my idea of heaven for applied psychoanalysis. I want psychoanalysts, clinical psychoanalysts, to embrace the role of public intellectual. This isn't easy for us as we tend to be a group that is uh, shy and more comfortable being experts in the privacy of a consulting room or in the controlled environment of writing a scientific paper, or non-scientific if you don't want to think of psychoanalysis <laughs> and science. Mm -hmm. um, it's my understanding that historian Russell Jacoby coined the term public intellectual in a, his 1984 book the Last Intellectuals, American Culture in the Age of Academia. Jacoby's public intellectual is a thinker who addresses a general and educated audience through speaking and writing. Many of you may be familiar with Jacoby's thinking as well as that of his critics. Briefly, he was concerned that young intellectuals were uh, only talking to each other in private intellectual settings. His idea of a private intellectual setting was the university, here where we are today. I would add uh, think tanks, uh, professional societies, and institutes to the concept of private intellectual settings. And this is important in psychoanalysis because um, most training in clinical psychoanalysis is done in freestanding institutes, which have very little connection to the, often, sadly, to the larger community. Um, and this conference, one reason I said it's so important to me personally is that this is an example of breaking down that isolation. Um, we can't keep talking only to each other if we want our field to survive. Jacoby issued a call for intellectuals to reclaim the vernacular and reassert themselves in public life. He argues that public and private intellectual endeavors thrive in a symbiotic relationship. My takeaway idea is this, great ideas need a public, and the public needs great ideas. I don't know if he's correct about his general assessment that there's a decline in the presence and influence of, of public intellectuals in other fields, such as political science or history or whatever. But it's certainly true about psychoanalysts. Um, MIT astrophysicist, novelist, and humanities professor Ellen Lightman um, tackles the prominence and obligations of the public intellectual in a paper he delivered at MIT in 1999. He defines three levels of public intellectual. Level one involves speaking to the public uh, exclusively about your own field. In psychoanalysis, an example of this would be Robert Lindner's classic 15-minute hour, which I think I read in junior high and maybe part of the reason I'm here today. Or the wildly popular new book, The Examined Life, by London analyst Stephen Gross. Excuse me, Gross, which had some kind of enormous sales effects in the last couple of months. Level two, uh, public intellectual, involves speaking and writing about your discipline and how it relates to social, cultural, the social, cultural, and political world around it. Sally Weintraub's climate change work would be a prime example of level two. For my part, I use psychoanalytic concepts including transference, narcissism, schizoid defenses, and disavowal in writing and speaking about such diverse phenomena as presidential campaigns, the television show Mad Men, Salander, the wonderful heroine of the girl with the dragon tattoo trilogy, and the complex relationship between the media, the public, and law enforcement following the Boston bombings. I've used the concepts of projective identification and disavowal 
to map out a psychoanalytic intervention regarding military suicide, arguing that the civilian disavowal of responsibility for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is an enormous contributor to the psychological morbidity and mortality suffered by returning service members. I'm still waiting for the Department of Defense to call me back. <laughs> Ask me, can you grant to do something about this? If I have delivered these ideas to them. These are all level two efforts. Lightman's level three public intellectual is someone who's been elevated to iconic status and is asked to speak about a wide range of public issues including many not connected to his or her original discipline. The University of Chicago's own Jonathan Lear and Martha Nussbaum might be considered level three public intellectuals, or they're getting there. Probably the pinnacle of level three public intellectual performance related to psychoanalysis was Slavoj Zizek's writing the copy for the Fall Back to School catalog for Abercrombie and Fitch in 2003. I know. Uh, Freud, of course, is the best example of public intellectual. He wrote about myths, jokes, art, anthropology, Shakespeare, civil society, relations, uh, and biography, and war. I think if we can find some ways to sustain conversations between clinical analysts and those academics who find its psychoanalytic ideas useful, the potential for growth for all of us would, in, in the value and richness of the ideas would be exponential. At a conference in art and medicine some years ago, I was giving a paper on the paintings of Egon Schiele, some psychoanalytic perspectives. And I met a group of art historians from another major local uh, university who I was kind of astonished to see how much they use psychoanalytic ideas in their work. And I asked them about where they learned their psychoanalysis, and they said from other art historians. And I asked if they'd ever spoken to a psychoanalyst, and they said no. And they really didn't seem that interested in talking to me. I was ready to have a conversation. I'm sure my paper on Sheila's art would have been better if I had had some conversations with art historians. Um, meanwhile, as a clinician, I'm concerned, as all my colleagues are, with um, uh, the future of our field and being able to, to see patients and train new psychoanalysts. And I think our being out in the world and having a voice on a wide range of events is um, the most important thing we can do to ensure a future for uh, psychoanalysis as a clinical profession. The necessity of psychoanalysts taking on the responsibility for public engagement happily co coincides with the availability of new means to accomplish this. I've, um, social media makes uh, being a public intellectual a whole new enterprise, and I've recently become very interested in blogging and Twitter as means for conveying psychoanalytic ideas to the broader public. Um, also for receiving new ideas that have enriched my intellectual life. As I've watched psycho uh, psychiatry and other mental health professions over the last several decades anxiously pursue evidence standardization and symptom checklists, I used to think that the proper role of psychoanalysis is analogous to the monasteries in the Middle Ages, pres preserving knowledge no longer in vogue or current use. Now I see things differently. I think we still have that conservative, conservatory role uh, for the mental health fields, but we also need to provide commentary on public affairs far outside the monastery, using the precious and infinitely usable concepts of psychoanalysis. Again, I want to extend my great thanks to the young organizers of this conference, uh, who indeed give me hope that psychoanalysis, both as a clinical method and a vital tool for public policy and understanding culture, does have a right for that. Thank you.
She had an intern in clinical psychology at the North Central Bronx Hospital and will be a postdoctoral fellow at the New York Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. She is interested in the social and cultural structuring of mental illness and its treatment. And her dissertation considered the sociology of psychoanalysis and reception in the United States and across time. Thanks so much. <coughs> Thanks to everyone for having me and also for this. Um, so um, I've been really interested in the history of psychoanalysis um, in the United States um, for a long time. And particularly in the different way, the very different ways that Americans have interpreted and understood psychoanalysis across time. Um, I've also been interested in the, the social conditions that have led Americans to understand psychoanalysis in certain ways. And these interests led me to interview a number of undergraduate students who, through their coursework, had some um, knowledge of psychoanalytic ideas in order to see how young, educated people are making sense of psychoanalysis today. And my hope was that this could help me better understand why psychoanalysis has receded from prominence on the American scene today. Um, and my interviews led me to feel that psychoanalysis fails to compel many, well not all, uh, young people today because of a general disconnectedness from the inner life. The students I spoke with generally um, were not compelled by the idea of the psychological interior, um, associating looking inward with something depleting, boring, fruitless, and something that would promote self-alienation almost more than self-discovery. And I believe that this alienation from deeply subjective material arose because of the very constructivist lens through which my informants viewed their world. Students, as I'll show, <laughs> more good. So students, as uh, you'll see for sure, were very in touch with the idea that truth is not in the world, but something that's essentially a product of our perception. And because students were already so aware that subjectivity, one's personal subjectivity, shapes the way they see the world, when they were confronted with psychoanalysis, which is all about how one's emotions and fantasy life shape the way we see things, they were almost disoriented. Um, in a way, they were already so immersed in their subjective lives that they had to reject any further involvement in that realm. So to begin to illustrate this, disinterest in the inner life that I felt among my students that I interviewed. Um, I quote a student who I asked who he imagined, the kind of person he thought would seek out psychoanalytic treatment. And he said, people who don't know why they feel the way they do. People who want to get more in touch with themselves. People who feel that parts of their lives close off to them and who want to figure out why those doors are there and how they, get, how they can get through them. It can apply to anyone. Your suburban soccer mom who's having a midlife crisis, or your suburban soccer dad who's having a midlife crisis, because it got into a rut and they don't know what they're doing anymore. <laughs> so, so at first, I mean, it really seems like he's saying that psychoanalysis can address core issues about motivation, fulfillment, core things. But then he associates this with soccer mom, soccer dad, the very icons of superficiality. So the implication is that looking to the depths actually is a shallow move. Another student did a kind of similar thing when she was um, discussing Freud's historical importance. She says, isn't it significant that he really starts theories of the self, that there are whole worlds inside of a person, that each person has a family, and that that is important? I grew up thinking that was really important, but you have to unlearn that, unlearn the self. When you're talking on the couch an hour about your family, you start thinking your experiences are so important that you're more important than you are. So we've come to Facebook and Twitter where people think they should just fill up the space with their random thoughts. So again, it's, at first it seems like introspection might be a compelling thing. It's about the world inside of us. But that, we learn, actually is superficial. It's just like tweaking. Students routinely pushed against the assumption that knowing oneself or knowing another involves discovering the contents of the psychological interior. My favorite way that this came out was I was speaking with a student about the case studies on hysteria, 
which she had read and which she found really bizarre. And I assumed that she meant like the symptoms were very outlandish or something or bizarre. And she says, no, not because the patients are going through a bizarre thing, more because the case studies are so limited to the room. You don't hear about Freud's life outside the room. There's such an intense focus on one person and the lives of people surrounding them. It makes it feel like a novel. I guess it's a problem with any story. It's not your own life. How much relatability is there? How much can you relate to any novel? So even though so many of us read novels precisely in order to connect with the inner lives of the characters, for her, it's a different thing. It becomes eerie to look so closely at the, the subjective world. And it actually makes the patient feel less real to the reader, this reader. Um, this bewilderment before the inner world doesn't seem to be unique to just the people I spoke with. Um, Mark Edmondson is an English professor, um, I think at NYU, who's written about um, his experience of teaching Freud to undergrads. And he had his students read um, an essay about repressed desire in Huck Finn. And he writes, the students, bright kids at a good university, couldn't figure out what to make of it. None of them had ever encountered the idea of repressed desire. The idea that one could be passionately drawn to another person yet not aware of it. Now, Freud's theory of repression is surely debatable, but never to have encountered the idea that struck me as an impoverished condition. And later in the same article, he writes, when my students listed their favorite movies, they had no sense that they were revealing much of anything about themselves. For, so for all the students, um, for many of the students, both he is discussing and that I interviewed, um, it seems that depth psychological contents aren't considered to be uh, the components of personal identity. As hard it is to wrap my head around that. Um, students were reluctant to sign on to the idea that the self has a dense and complicated and possibly partially hidden interior. They seem to want to see people as a little bit less opaque, a little more readable, not quite so encoded. Um, and I'll give I think I'll give two examples of this impulse that I saw in responses. Um, I think I'll just paraphrase. Um, so one student, in an actually very articulate, thoughtful way, made the case that it's really the manifest content of dreams that reveal what's on someone's mind and what's going on with them. Um, she agrees that dreams are meaningful and communicate. But her view is that they do so in a, very, in a relatively straightforward way. You don't have to go down into the unconscious depths for the dream to acquire significance. Um, along with other people I interviewed, um, she's rejecting the psychoanalytic effort to translate the visible realm into a more complex and presumably more fundamental one. For her, the manifest reality is just as real as any latent reality. Um, another student was very troubled by the Wolfman case, and particularly by the way that Freud um, understand, writes about the impact of the Wolfman's witnessing of the primal scene. So he really, his complaint was that Freud focuses way too much on the retrospective rendering of the event rather than the initial impression itself. Um, he feels that the original trauma of witnessing the primal scene is way underemphasized. Um, so his suggestion is maybe witnessing the primal scene isn't harmful because it works on and gets worked on by fantasy, but maybe it stands alone. Maybe it's traumatic in and of itself without having to be elaborated in psychological space. So the impulse that seems to be behind these and other responses was um, a desire to see the psyche as a little bit more transparent. You can understand a dream just by looking at it Events work relatively directly on people, not so. Events are. Oh, events work on people rather in a relatively direct way. It's not so much the meaning of the event that matters, it's the, it's the literal event. Um, so, as I thought about these interviews, it came to feel that this skittishness about the inner world was connected to another prominent feature of students' experience. And this was their very explicit constructivism. They were very aware of the truth, not in the world.
world and socially generated, the reality can be served as a part of our own creation. And like the good postmodernists, they are and were, they celebrated this. They didn't mourn the fact that we can't access reality directly. This was just a taken for granted feature of their world. And their constructivism shaped in consequential ways the way they interpreted psychoanalysis. Um, like many in the field today, they regarded psychoanalysis as more like a literary or aesthetic endeavor rather than a strictly scientific one. As one student said, we didn't meet Freud in the spirit of this is how brains work. Um, another said, psychoanalytic theory is compelling not in a universal, universal way, but maybe as a way of understanding, a strategy of explanation, in other words, a hermeneutic. Um, moreover, psychoanalysis, the ability of psychoanalysis to cure does not depend on its ability to access truth. As one student put it, psychoanalysis has tremendous power, but it's impossible to evaluate how accurate it is to individual experience. It's not relevant whether or not Elizabeth von Ar had edible desires, as much as Freud telling her she did make her better. Constructivism also led them to be highly critical of what they saw as Freud's misguided confidence in his own ideas. <laughs> Students had a humble stance toward knowledge. They were aware that theories are always one of many possible interpretations, and they felt they expected their theorists to share their humility, but they saw Freud very much as lacking this. So one complained Freud doesn't leave room for any other interpretations. Another said, any writing on any subject is going to be partial, a partial truth. Why does this have to be one? Still another, Freud should have allowed for a multiplicity of truths. You can have many truths about human sexuality and be okay with that. It's very common, common complaint. Students' constructivism was attended by a very striking self-consciousness. They were aware of the roles of minds in the construction of reality. They spontaneously thought about and this came out really striking me in the interviews. Um, so in general, they were very, they, and this is perhaps surprising, they accepted many of the controversial basics of writing theory, infantile sexuality, Oedipus, things like that, but they were very disinterested in talking about them at all. It just, it was, this was not a compelling area of discussion. But they were, process by which Freud created his ideas, or the process of reading itself. So they might have, they may speculate on how Freud generated a theory from the data, or they might think about how it was that they themselves became persuaded by an argument. So clearly, instead of immersing themselves in the content of what they were reading, they were monitoring themselves as they were reading. Um, they were almost interacting more with their own minds than with the And my view is that this self-conscious way of being in the world, um, this strong tendency to think about thought itself, made it difficult for students to experience introspection as compelling or even particularly revealing. In a way, students have bracketed themselves from the world by turning their attention so much to their own thought. So for these people who are already so self-conscious to turn inward even further, to be disorienting. And this is why I think they reacted to introspection as if it was something that would deplete them or take them away from themselves. Um, another way to put it, as I kind of started to say, was that they were already so aware that private subjectivity shapes the way they see the world, that the idea of exploring their emotions and personal history and all, the, the, all of our features that shape the way we see the world, just it was like too much for them to bear. They wanted to get out of there. They wanted to get out of there that's rather than in it. So they wanted to look at the manifest content of the dreams, look at the event. We could say that the desire to, let's just look at the brain instead of meaning, which came up a few times, is part of the same impulse. To get out of, let's get out of the mind. So um, I'll conclude by just saying that it seems that students' responses were very paradoxical. Um, on an overt level, they celebrated the postmodern insight that the mind gives rise to the world. 
But on another level, which came out so clearly when I spoke with them, they seemed burdened by that awareness, as if they had had too much of their own mind. Um, and I feel that psychoanalysis at the turn of the 21st century might be a casualty of that paradox, because it draws people inward. It must be rejected, because it's a direction people cannot bear to go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, next we have uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Spolos. Uh, Dr. Spolos studies psych or practices studies, practices psychoanalysis and psychiatry in Omaha, Nebraska. He's a member of the New Lacanian School and the World Association of Psychoanalysis, and he also serves as adjunct professor and acting chair of psychiatry at the Creighton Universal School of Medicine. His publications on psychoanalysis and related matters including the co-authored books, uh, co-authored book Lacan and Addictions, have appeared in nine languages. Thank you. I want to thank the organizers uh, of this meeting, the Society for Psychoanalytic Inquiry, for the invitation to speak here this weekend. The psychoanalytic meetings that I go to are usually Lacanian meetings. But like Aesop's fable of the fox and the crow, a flattering invitation brought me here to the University of Chicago. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> the conference organizers gave us a series of questions to address regarding psychoanalysis today. I would like to start my remarks with a reference to a way in which Lacan defined psychoanalysis in Seminar 17 as a discourse or a social bond that might exist between speaking beings. This definition places psychoanalysis within the realm of speech and language, and indeed, it is with words that we practice. This definition transforms a whole series of debates about the identity of the psychoanalyst. For example, I supervise residents in a psychiatric clinic. When they talk about their clinical work from time to time, clearly the words spoken between the patient and the resident psychiatrist can be described as something happening within the discourse psychoanalysis. <clears throat> the psychoanalytic discourse can exist without either of those participating being aware of it. And as discourse, it existed before Freud described it for the first time. <clears throat> On the flip side of that, just because a person has been named as a psychoanalyst, is no guarantee that the speech that that individual engages in with his or her patients should be understood as psychoanalysis. I can look in the mirror and think to myself, I am a psychoanalyst. But as we learn from the first lessons of Lacan regarding the imaginary, such recognition always carries within itself the potential for misrecognition. The attribution of identity is a separate matter from spoken discourse. This basic approach to psychoanalysis has implications for the institutional questions that the conference organizers posed to those of us on this panel. In some psychoanalytic groups, it is imaginary rules that define the process by which a person is named a psychoanalyst certain number of sessions or supervisions, being present in a class, a class even in neurosciences, <laughs> and so forth. In the schools of the World Association of Psychoanalysis, however, there is a recognition of Lacan's famous statement that the analyst 
authorizes himself or herself. Any two people may engage in spoken discourse that could be structured as psychoanalysis. But, for while the speech of any two people may fall within such a discourse, it is an ethical responsibility of the analyst to conduct himself or herself with those who come for help in such a way that is consistent with psychoanalysis. While we describe the practice of psychoanalysis itself as something we do as analysts with the spoken word, I think we must, on the other hand, recognize the significance of those developments in the last work of Lacan that reframe the practice as one of reading. A shift from listening to words to a reading of the text of the analysand, a reading of the unconscious, a reading of the symptom. The genius of Freud was to recognize that those seemingly meaningless phenomena of the patients that he saw, the dreams, slips, the symptoms, and so forth, are in fact a kind of text that is to be read by the analyst. Freud, we must acknowledge, had a very particular way of reading these texts. They are always read through the perspective of the Oedipus complex. It, it, it is hard for us in our current moment to recognize the shock that this reading of Freud had on his patients and on society. From a clinical perspective, though, many of these first people who came in to see an analyst felt a dramatic relief, a significant diminution in the suffering of their symptoms as these symptoms were deciphered through Freud's reading. To me, there are two different issues in play here with Freud's work. First, there is the hypothesis that Freud introduces regarding the unconscious, and for me at least, hypothesis is what it remains uh, to today. In Lacan's classic formulation, the unconscious is that set of signifiers, the treasure trove of signifiers, he puts it, that form the backdrop against which unconscious formations, such as dreams and symptoms, may be decoded. The second issue with Freud relates to the Oedipal complex, the Oedipus complex. It seems to me that Freud used this concept to master the unconscious, to organize it, to structure it. And this had effects, but effects that did not last long. By the 1920s, Freud was already lamenting the loss of therapeutic efficacy of psychoanalysis and the persistence of symptoms in the patients of that era who came in for psychoanalysis even after long periods of psychoanalysis. The Oedipal interpretations were no longer working the hermeneutic aspect of psychoanalysis had lost its power. For me, psychoanalysis is, is not a hermeneutics, or it's not only a hermeneutics. We should note that the very moment when patients begin to come into their sessions no longer complaining of meaningless symptoms or troubling dreams, but rather come in to their sessions complaining of unresolved Oedipal wishes is the very moment where the Oedipal reading will fail. The analyst must read otherwise. When the symptoms were meaningless, an Oedipal meaning was an other reading. But when the Oedipal hypothesis becomes part of the world, an analyst may no longer use it to read otherwise, for it is incorporated into the unconscious. The unconscious is not a stable phenomenon, which is the union position. 
It has a link to the society in which people live. And society absorbed the first Freudian discoveries. I want to suggest that we fast forward all the way to the work of Lacan in the late 60s and 70s to reach a point where the residual repetitive effects of symptoms are no longer a sign of the failure of psychoanalysis, but become the grounds for the basis of another way for psychoanalysis to work. It is the moment of the 60s and the advent of what we now call postmodernism that puts psychoanalysis in a situation where it faces a different society and a change in the unconscious. I would characterize three responses of psychoanalysts to the 60s. On the one hand, in the face of a clear decline in paternal authority, a weakening of authoritarian structures in many forms, there are movements in psychoanalysis which seek to reassert the power of the father, of Oedipus. This is what we might term a conservative response from psychoanalysis. In the face of social change with regard to authority, there is a reaction to prop it back up. There is a second response, which is that which celebrates the unconscious. Rather than using Oedipus to tame the unconscious, the unconscious and the drives are instead placed in what Jacqueline Miller refers to as the zenith of society. Society is no longer organized around an ideal, previously derived from the father, but by the drive object. This argument from psychoanalysis aligns well with Fred Jameson's comment regarding the colonization of the unconscious by capitalism in postmodernism as these drives are often linked no longer to the old Freudian partial objects, but rather to ready-made drive objects created by consumer society. These drives are something to be identified with and to pursue without any restriction, thus the development of addiction as the paradigmatic psychic state of our current moment. It is the proposal of Deleuze and Gattari against Oedipus and in praise of schizophrenia that is the most clearly articulated intellectual version of this. Lacan's response marks the third response. Lacan responded to this moment of the 60s in a way that remains relevant today. The act of reading the symptoms will no longer make the symptoms go away as it did a century ago. But we must not simply celebrate the symptoms for it is certainly a source of pain and suffering, and to go back to the Freudian formulation linked with the death drive. I would say the task is not to enjoy the symptom, as with Deleuze, or the addictive push, as much as to help find a way to live with the symptom. How might we help our patients find a way to live with their particular symptom, their partner's symptom, in a world where the old rules no longer hold sway? The consequences of this in the clinic are immense. It is clear, for example, that a century ago, Freud did not know what to do with psychosis. He placed that psychiatric category outside the realm of psychoanalysis, and psychoanalysis has been grappling with that ever since. With his study of Joyce, Lacan in the 70s proposed a new formulation of psychosis. Namely, Lacan tackled the question of how James Joyce used his very particular symptom, which Lacan identified as writing itself, as a way to prevent him from falling into psychosis from an acute psychotic episode. The hypothesis is that Joyce used his symptom as a way to evade or avoid acute psychosis. At this moment, we move from the symptom as only a source of suffering to the symptom is something which may provide the subject the possibility of a stabilization, of finding a place in the world. And it was not only psychosis that baffled Freud. Freud also struggled with the desire of women. Freud's formulations on this matter are not completely without value, but seem so convoluted, the negative Oedipus complex and so forth. 
For Freud, the key to sexuation, to the difference between a man and a woman, was a matter of biology, of nature, of the difference in the genitals. For Lacan, the question here is not one of nature. For the speaking being, sexual identity and sexual orientation are a function of language and not of the body. Man and woman are signifiers. This is not to deny biological sexuality or genetics, but rather point out the fundamental fact of sexual identity for the speaking being as a function of language. And we see this very clearly in uh, transsexuals. But even further, there's nothing natural about sexuality for any speaking being. What is an instinct with an animal in the encounter with language and with society becomes the drive for the speaking being. The drive is a function of the impact of language on the body. Indeed, this is nothing other than trauma itself, which has nothing to do with terrible events as such, though these may have traumatic impacts of their own, but with the way in which words leave a mark on the speaking being. And when it comes to the issue of sexuality as a relation to another, to one's intimate partner, we find Lacan's formulation on the matter in the Arbata Rapo Sexuel, which we might translate as there is no sexual ratio, where there is no sexual relationship, where there is no sexual harmony, perhaps. A formula that indicates that for every speaking being, sexuality is something that is struggled with in one way or another. There is no sexual utopia. Although speaking beings will often act as if there is, and why not? But uh, that is only a fantasy. Note, however, that we also have love. Love what seems to be now is one of the most fragile things in today's world. Love, as Lacan states, allows us a way of making a link with another speaking being. As analysts, we must assist those who come to us to find a way to struggle through the challenges of sexuality and love <coughs> in today's world. In these remarks, I've tried to point out the ways in which we see an unconscious that changes, even one that changes in response to psychoanalysis itself. I want to close with a brief vignette that may elucidate something about interpretation in this post-edible, post-hermeneutic psychoanalysis, where it is not our goal to put meaning to the analysis words. I want to give an example of an analyst at work in this new world, thus to offer a reply to Leo Bersani's wish to know how psychoanalysis may interpret differently today. This is a story recounted in a documentary by Susan Homel, who was in analysis with Lacan in 1974. One piece of background to the story is vital. Namely, that Suzanne was a young girl when her country was occupied by the Nazis. In this documentary, she spoke of a session she had with Lacan in which she was speaking about a dream. And she said to Lacan that she woke up every morning at 5 o'clock, adding that the Gestapo came to get the Jews from their homes at 5 o'clock in the morning. She states that at that moment, Lacan jumped up from his chair, walked over, and gave her an extremely gentle caress on her cheek. She immediately understood this as the way in which Lacan had changed Gestapo to geste à peau which in French would mean a gesture on the skin or a touch on the skin. She described it as tender, an appeal to humanity. It did not take away her pain, but turned it into something different, something she could live with. 
and had an effect she remembers. She talked about how she can still feel the caress on her skin 40 years later. Finally, we have, thank you, Dr. Spolos, uh, uh, closing up our plenary for the evening uh, before we open up to some discussion will be uh, Dr. Uh, Gary Walls. Uh, he's been teaching and practicing, uh, or he's been teaching uh, and training in psychoanalytic therapy, though not actually a full psychoanalytic practitioner. Uh, we found out this morning. Uh, for 25 years in Chicago uh, as a professor in several area doctoral programs and in private practice. He's written and presented many papers on the mutual implications of psychoanalysis and politics and therapy of politics. He was president of the Chicago Association for Psychoanalytic Psychology and received their award for distinguished contributions to psychoanalysis and human rights for his activism against the involvement of psychologists in politically motivated torture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walls. Thank you. Uh, those are uh, three fascinating, very different papers. Uh, which I was also surprised that it was different as mine is from theirs, but there are points of overlap that, um, that I might remark on. Um, over a hundred years ago, psychoanalysis succeeded in becoming the first widespread talking psychotherapy against the obstacles of resistance to its new and countercultural ideas. So psychoanalysis doesn't have a extended history of popular support as some period. In some ways, psychoanalytic treatment became a victim of its own success, undermined by its overreaching promises, particularly in the mid century by reductionistic, it, and it became a victim of its own success also by reductionistic and superficial knockoffs, such as CDT and behavior modification and by positioning itself as a medical treatment under the auspices of the psychiatric profession, you know that. And by the dominance of a logical positivist epistemology within academic psychology. These forces combined to undermine the credibility of psychoanalytic treatment with the public. The commodification of healthcare through managed care provided a mechanism for the direct assault on psychoanalytic practice. The isolation of psychoanalysis outside of universities and within medical-run institutes crippled our ability to influence scientific and public opinion. Psychoanalysis must reorganize its institution to make them less exclusive and more open, which is a process that's begun, which Pretty talked about somewhat already. It must modify its theories and practice to empower new science psychoanalytic practices and engage as public intellectuals in <clears throat> to counter the distortions, misunderstandings, and lies that threaten the viability and relevance of psychoanalysis in the 21st century. I will discuss specific misunderstandings and recognition by the public of psychoanalysis as a powerful theory um, for regaining acceptance and recognition by the public of psychoanalysis as a powerful theory, theory for understanding and treatment for human suffering. Um, you know, in the, the questions that we were posed with, uh, it was mentioned that um, um, undergraduate um, Psychologist, scientific psychologists ravage psychoanalysis, but that's something that they've been always doing. Uh, undergraduate academic psychology and academic psychology departments within universities have historically been steeped in logical positivism and behaviors, behaviors and cognitive approaches. And there's been relatively, there's been some ups and downs, but pretty much that's been a, a constant across the century. Psychoanalysis has never had much of a foothold in universities, at least most universities. It's been since the APA in the last 20, 15, 20 years, uh, emphasized, began to emphasize, quote, evidence-based therapies uh, with a vociferousness um, uh, that I find striking. It's um, um, increased 
public and uh, professional skepticism about the validity of psychoanalysis, <coughs> I think that one thing we need to do that we discussed in some of the, some of the uh, sessions here, when one is what kind of psych science is psychoanalysis, that one thing we need to do is rather than uh, accept the agenda of academic psychology, for example, but to actually address and oppose the logical positive strategies by which they define scientific psychology, in particular, uh, um, the, their misuse and misunderstanding of uh, probability statistics, in the, for example, with the t-test uh, that they they uh, utilize in uh, group comparison studies, they actually calculate the wrong probability, actually the inverse of the probability that they're looking for. They're trying to reject the hypothesis, and you'd expect to find out the probability if that the null hypothesis is true or false. You calculate the probability that the, term, uh, that the null hypothesis is true or false. And actually, what they do is they calculate the probability that you get these data given that the null hypothesis is true. So they assume null hypothesis is true. They calculate the wrong probability. No one seems to notice this, in spite of the fact that it completely invalidates the logic of their experiments. There are other, there's at least three or four fatal errors in logic um, and understanding of statistics and research design that, that are ignored that allow them to develop the second academic purpose of psychology to you know, develop journals and books that would, of course, explode in this room, all of which would make um, good um, kindling. <laughs> I think we have to expose and debunk that because uh, I think that their the scientific, their scientific psychology and psychoanalysis not is, is a pernicious threat to psychoanalysis. Uh, the decline of psychoanalysis began in the 1960s when it became more um, apparent that it had not been as successful in curing the vast array of uh, psychological and psychiatric disorders that it promised that it would take. And so people were beginning to become disappointed in the solution, and that allowed an opening for alternatives to move forward. And two of the ones that moved forward were behavioral uh, modification, um, even though it had very little, very tiny track record of actually working with, with uh, psychopathology or human suffering. Um, but um, there's a very influential article in 1960 in a psychiatric journal that described behavioral modification. It was wildly influential across psychiatric hospitals in the country, and almost overnight, behavior modification became installed in many uh, psychiatric hospitals. Um, uh, there was also some of the like um, um, Prudy was saying that um, we shot ourselves in the foot in many ways. I think Kurt Eisler's actually confess to shooting myself in the foot with respect to psychoanalysis, so that others can disagree. But Kurt Eisler shot all of us in the foot in the early 1950s with his papers on what he considered to be classical psychoanalysis, his, his notion of parameters, which was any departure from what he regarded as standard technique, which created a rigid orthodoxy and a closed-mindedness within psychoanalysis that was absolutely crippling in terms of its mm, uh, openness to new ideas, uh, it, its ability to evolve and develop um, um, new concepts and new techniques. And there was so much pressure and conformity created a very, very toxic atmosphere within many psychoanalytic institutes. Um, and, and that's where most of psychoanalysis was, psychoanalytic ideas were being developed. Um, the, rival, the rival treatment approaches to psychoanalysis, like behaviorism and cognitive behaviorism, actually were developed separately it, within the universities, within psychology departments, whereas psychoanalysis developed in clinics and in institutes, you know, freestanding institutes. So, in some sense, they're um, they're not they're parallel tracks. 
so uh, they were not actually in the same field competing and interacting with each other in any sort of um, way that could, could um, stimulate dialogue around them. Uh, the insularity of the institutes um, and the development of jargonistic journal articles which spoke to no one but other psychoanalysts and an abandonment of Freud's outreach or public intellectual activity, which has also been mentioned before, um, is a serious shortcoming which has hurt psycho development of psychoanalysis and its acceptance by the public and uh, within uh, the um, uh, world of psychotherapy and, and treatment. Uh, so that I think has led to some of our problems, which have led to the uh, line in the, our program here about how psychoanalysis is fast disappearing. I actually don't think psychoanalysis is fast disappearing, although there are I think, huge threats to uh, its viability as a practice and as a career. It, it, psychoanalysis is very, it's expanding, it seems, in, but it's expanding in, in uh, literature and sociology and other, other um, disciplines uh, as opposed to in psychology or in psychiatry, which, which is attractive. Um, I would point out that uh, the PsyD programs, the, doctors, you know, the professional schools of psychology, and I'm not real keen necessarily on the being I taught it, most of the major ones in the area, so I've contributed to the problem. I'm willing to surrender myself to the psychoanalytic police. <laughs> but um, the fact is that the uh, Psyche programs have been much more friendly and open to, to teaching psychoanalysis, and um, I think that's there's something positive in that. And uh, they supply the Chicago Association for Psychoanalytic Psychology and the Chicago Center for Psychoanalysis with, with uh, scores or at least dozens of, of young uh, um, trainees who are, who are trying to develop their interest in psychoanalysis and who are hopefully going to provide a co more cohorts for training in psychoanalysis. Future, so I think that provides a little bit of hope in itself, uh, while at the same time we're building a field with too many therapists in some sense. Um, I think that for psychoanalysis to proceed in the 21st century, uh, psychoanalysis must, must change and embrace the theoretical and technical pluralism um, that has emerged, um, sometimes seen as factionalism and so forth, and sometimes people from these different theories, they clash, they fight, and they argue, and some of that's good, and some of it's dialogue, and that's positive, but you get your Freudians, or your neo-Freudians, your interpersonal people, object relations, cell psychologists, contemporary relational theorists. Uh, and it's really critical, critical that we abandon the notion of, of, of unification on the order of um, Really, the people who mostly seek unification are the ego psychologists. They want us all to unify as ego psychologists. So they put up the PDM as the psychiatric, I'm sorry, the psychoanalytic diagnostic manual, but really it should have been called the ego psychology diagnostic manual. But you see, if you're going to present yourself to the public as a science, you've got to unify. You know, physics doesn't have five theories of the universe. Right? At any given time, you try to pack just one. They're stumbling a little bit, they've got quantum theory relative to the theory, you can't seem to put those together, but, you know, it's, you know, they pretty much, uh, the definition of a science is one that's unified by a single paradigm, and, and I think that's one reason why there's a push among some people for, for a unification of, of psychology and the end of uh, all these factional disputes, where I think, in order to survive, we need to embrace pluralism and proceed forward. Um, with an eye towards uh, integration, uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of eclecticism, although practically speaking, embracing pluralism is to acknowledge that, that it's a field we're eclectic, but most individual analysts or therapists, uh, not most, I think it's often uh, positive to try to integrate so that you can practice coherently rather than utilize a bag of tricks where you just put things from one particular school or another, and that's my perspective. Um, I think that for psychoanalysis to move forward in the 21st century, that, I think that uh, this addresses some of the 
Katie's findings um, that, that, there, that um, there's some degree to which young people today have already been changed by the psychoactive milieu, so this, the interiorization is something that they kind of take for granted and construct it as at least among your color, which is probably fairly unusual, um, more well educated than the average person. But nonetheless, um, I think we need to move beyond understanding individual psychoanalytically only in terms of drives and family dynamics and begin to contextualize therapy in societal, political, economic, and cultural frameworks. And to bring these frameworks into the psychoanalytic um, consulting room as part of the interpretations we make about helping our patients understand the sources of their misery. Um,
We also, and I won't offer my comments on why I think that is, but just pose another issue, which is I think we need to be very cautious in talking about the success of psychoanalysis. That makes me very antsy, that phrase. And you know, I'm not the only one. There's a very interesting paper by, um, his name is Norman Zimmer was an American analyst it's in Diogenes in the early 60s. And this is a moment maybe of the, the, the pinnacle of the power of psychoanalysis in this country. And he says this. He says, psychoanalysis is everywhere. He says, psychoanalysis is in the medical schools, it's in the universities, it's in the social work programs, it's in the courts. It's in the legal system, we have analysts talking about cases in courts, in popular culture, in movies, and not literature. And Zinberg comments, psychoanalysis is everywhere in the US. But he was very worried about psychoanalysis as a practice, and thought that there was a risk of it losing its way. And this was in 62 or 63, no right before the, you know, the, the significant decline in this country. I think I'm worried when I hear discussion about the success of psychoanalysis, it needing to be everywhere. So I just throw those comments out. Well, I, I um, work closely with colleagues in Western Europe and in France and Mexico and Latin America, and um, I think we have different psychoanalyses in terms of some of the issues of uh, thriving versus um, alienation from the uh, uh, mental health practices and so forth, because they say they have exactly the same experiences that we have in the United States um, in terms of uh, patients and uh, teaching opportunity to CBT taking over psychology in much of Western Europe um, and uh, funding opportunities for treatment also being limited to evidence-based treatments. So I think that your experience with the Lacanian um, societies and colleagues is probably quite different. But, um, in the traditional Freudian uh, international and uh, psychology, psychoanalysis, it seems to be, from my experience, worldwide. Uh, yeah, let's have questions over here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Was, was somebody going to respond to that earlier? Okay, I'll just go with my question. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you for this amazing conference. Uh, it's, you know, lots of amazing discussions. Um, as an overall um, sort of observation uh, uh, about the, uh, the talks given here, um, I, and I should maybe say that I, I'm in this tradition of uh, quantitative uh, large-scale psychotherapy research, although I have enjoyed it immensely with all these, these talks here. But um, in these talks there, uh, I've sensed this juxtaposition of psychoanalysis versus uh, evidence-based treatments, uh, psychoanalysis versus academic psychology, uh, psychoanalysis versus natural sciences, uh, psychoanalysis versus capitalist society. So there's a sense of, of battle and opposition. And um, uh, at the same time, um, in ac academic psychology, for example, surely recognizes uh, that we are not aware of many of our cognitive processes, for example. Um, also, um, in very many different domains of, of scientific um, uh, um, knowledge, it's recognized that a person's early relationships have a very significant impact on their later lives. Uh, lots of these core principles of psychoanalysis. And also in, in therapy practice and in other sorts of interventions, many of the, uh, the innovations of psychoanalysis have been taken up, maybe not credited as such, but they have uh, been taken up, such as being in the moment, observing what one's thinking about, 
making sense of of of, uh, of events and so on. So I just want to suggest uh, that uh, since psychoanalytic um, ideas uh, and innovations have this kind of popularity, um, uh, um, maybe the only problem is this juxtaposition of psychoanalysis against everything else, that it is just uh, not a good brand at the present time, like uh, Coca-Cola or Apple or whatever, and the solution to these problems would be just to think of a new name for psychoanalysis, <laughs> rather than call it psychoanalysis. Um, but um, just to put a final, a slightly more serious um, observation, um, in, in this, um, to take this point slightly more seriously, um, I think also psychoanalysis uh, perhaps could be, uh, could become closer to other fields of, uh, say, scientific or, or political thought without sort of this um, sometimes perhaps um, um, overdone, that's not the right word, but this sort of forced oppositionality to other uh, fields. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. My thought is that I'll stop being defensive of psychoanalysis when it stops being attacked. I agree with you about, I'm, I've never been as uh, comfortable with the oppositional stance, and I have no problem with being scientific. Uh, I think that the dependent variables that are tested in psychotherapy research are wrong for psychoanalysis. Um, and I've always wanted somebody to do a study on income change. Um, because most psychotherapy research, as I understand it, is testing symptom relief. And if you uh, have a dependent variable be a change in income, I've had patients go from incapacitated uh, to making a good living and supporting a family. So I think that the, the variables are wrong. And, and a conversation with uh, researchers, uh, empirical researchers, would be very valuable. The only other problem, though, is that it's a very subjective, individualized process. And I think that there's problems with evaluating something like that. One of my favorite studies against evidence-based medicine is the British paper, I don't know if any of you know it. Um, it's on the um, double-blind control study of parachute use in gravitational <coughs> challenge. Um, and you can't do a double blind control study for parachute use. So there's some parallels to psychoanalysis for that. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, offer a reply to your, uh, you know, I think, very thoughtful comments there, and attempt to uh, paraphrase some comments uh, about psychoanalysis from uh, uh, Jacqueline Miller. I don't think psychoanalysis, one point that I think, well, I could be wrong looking back over some of the talks this weekend, but it seems that for many, yeah, I would say, I don't think psychoanalysis is an idealism. I don't think psychoanalysis attempts to purport some, you know, vision for what should happen with its patients, or maybe even what should happen for, for the world. Uh, I think there were mixed opinions on that issue. Uh, among the speakers this weekend, but for me, uh, psychoanalysis should not be an, an idealism. But in reference to your comment about psychoanalysis being oppositional, it, it, to me there are two ways to think about it. One has to do with uh, a, a point that was raised by many, many people this weekend, is, is psychoanalysis revolutionary? And, and, and to that I would say no. Because the revolutionary perspective itself is also an idealism. You know, it's a, it's a you know, utopian future we're moving towards, or something along those lines. So, I, you know, if the oppositional stance is one of wanting to overthrow something, I don't think that's the case. You know, while I may have issues on a theoretical perspective with regard to the intellectual basis for cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, other treatments, I can very peacefully coexist with my cognitive therapy friends 
you know, my psychopharmacology friends, with whom I will refer patients back and forth. I don't. I can live in this pluralistic treatment world quite happily. Uh, but on the other hand, there is something inherently subversive about psychoanalysis, such that it never. It, it doesn't work well when it's living very happily within other realms. It's always a little bit outside of something. So uh, if, if that, uh, I know maybe that's not a direct reply to what you're, you're, you were asking, but that's, to me, how I would think of that issue. Thank you. And 
in my view, psychoanalysis, contrarily, is inherently at odds with the creation of wage slaves. <clears throat> in moving psychoanalysis forward, how would you deal with the contradiction between capitalism and psychoanalysis? I think he makes some good points, Jordan. Uh, <laughs> and I think that that is part of the problem, that managed care, in fact, which is the mechanism for the direct assault on the practice of psychoanalysis, is precisely the corporate takeover of healthcare. And these people do not believe in psychotherapy. They don't believe in an inner life. They believe in the buck. And so they believe shorter is better, and so they, they're going to support a superficial, cheap, cheap treatment, which comes up with pseudo-scientific outcome studies that you can multiply by the billions because they only take 12 weeks. But they, you know, you think about it, you apply just a tiny bit of skepticism to what CBT is claiming, namely that they can cure uh, lifelong, deeply crippling emotional illnesses and distress in 12 sessions of group therapy, or 12 sessions of individual therapy, it's like saying, oh, I've got a cure for cancer, it's, uh, come tomorrow afternoon, we'll be done. So, and I've got evidence to prove it, you know, and, and you know, so, I think it is a problem, because precisely what you're saying, that it's not, that psychoanalysis chooses to be adversarial, or in opposition to all these forces in society, um, you could say psychoanalysis, in a sense, picked the fight in the sense that it raised ideas that many in power in society don't want to hear because I think it is, it, it raises awareness, it raises the capacity to critique, for social critique and for, in fact, evaluate your own situation and come up with more, um, and be empowered to alter the relations you're embedded in. And capitalism doesn't like that. They like the status quo. They like managers to stay managers, the wealthy to stay wealthy, and the workers to come to work and uh, do what the boss says. So they don't, they're they not in favor of anything that increases self-awareness or a critical perspective. And I mean, I, I consider the battle, the political battle against capitalism in, in a direct way as Botticelli, specialized first name, Stephen Botticelli in New York, says you can't really, psychoanalysis, you can't really change one person at a time and therefore win the political battle. The political battle has to be fought uh, outside the consulting room. It has to be fought, it has to be fought in political grounds. And I do think that, that within the United States, that's where the most serious decline in the support for the practice of psychoanalysis is happening. In Germany, you're still entitled to 300 lifetime sessions of psychoanalysis. In most European countries, uh, categorize psychoanalysis as a scientific, evidence-based treatment, but in the United, uh, the United States, you know, which is dominated by all these um, um, wastelands of behaviors and cognitive behaviors, and I know that's derogatory, but I'm just being honest. That's my opinion. So, um, I've been in them, I've, you know, been subjected to them. I think there's a um, something to watch for, which is it, it may be that some of the um, industrial-driven constraints on healthcare delivery are going to fall apart, and psychoanalysis will have a role to play. And I'll give a specific example with soldiers and veterans. Um, there's a program called the Soldiers Project, run by some psychoanalysts, and they offer psychoanalytic psychotherapy for as long as it takes to any service member, family member, or veteran who wants help. They have, I think they've seen 10,000 people by now. I might have the numbers wrong. They have had zero suicides. Zero. And the Department of Defense, which has been using ridiculously cheap methods, including apps, believe it or not. I mean, I'm not kidding. Apps on your cell phone avatars for the distressed soldier um, and, and uh, positive psychology, which is 
a travesty of psychology in my opinion. Um, but they're all key because they had, they had yoga centers and aromatherapy at an army base. When soldiers keep killing themselves, but we have a program that we can say psychoanalytic psychotherapy, there's no, I mean, not that there can't be a suicide, but if you help people create uh, a meaningful, uh, you know, integrate their experiences into a, a meaningful view of themselves and their future, they don't kill themselves. So I think some of this will, if we stand by and keep arguing, will um, turn around. That's fine. Uh, one other uh, comment. You know, one thing I was surprised, you know, I didn't attend every session, but surprised that I didn't hear about uh, this weekend is the, the free clinic you know, movement in psychoanalysis, you know, which began, I think, in Berlin. The Berlin Institute had the first one of these. Um, um, the Lacanians got very interested in this and uh, began a free clinic they called the CPCT in Paris. Oh, maybe six or eight years ago, and that spread throughout to a number of different countries within the WAP. And um, th this has been a very energizing thing for analysts in, in my particular orientation. Many of them volunteer their time there. You know, each one of these free clinics is set up different. In the, in the Lacanian ones, the offer isn't of psychoanalysis, but that you can have, um, I think it's 20 sessions with an analyst, the opportunity for an encounter with an analyst, which might then lead to a referral or maybe a resolution to the crisis which brought the person in seeking help. But in any case, it's free for those who uh, who, uh, who want to, to come in for that. And I, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't denigrate too much the importance that short treatments can have for people. So I'm going to take a little issue with the, 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 the absolute criticism of 12 session treatments. I think, you know, in my practice, for people come to see me privately, you know, there are people who come, and they come once. One session. That's it. I'm satisfied. I don't need to see you again. Okay. Call me if you want. I mean, other people may come a couple of times. Sometimes people come a dozen times, and then other people, they want to come all the time. I mean, it, it varies a lot. And, and, and some of these short treatments can be very uh, therapeutically effective. Not everyone wants to take their analysis to the absolute last moment of analysis. And in fact, my perspective is that the, 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 the long analysis is useful for someone who wants to practice analysis. But the therapeutic benefit of the analysis kind of gets smaller and smaller the longer it goes on. Yes, there's moments where things happen and don't. But I think lots, you know, lots of therapeutic benefit can happen in a short treatment with an analyst. I mean, so I'm, I'm not, I don't have anything personal against short, uh, against short treatments. So. Well, I don't have anything, any problem with short-term treatments. But I'm assuming you're not claiming that these people who came in for one or twelve sessions were thereby cured of debilitating lifelong depressions or anxiety disorders, but were like a band-aid works pretty well on a, a paper cut. It, it, it doesn't work very well on a sword, you know, through the gut. I, I would say, I mean, that's a good, that's a valid point, but I think sometimes People don't want uh, an absolute, I mean, I, I think people want different things. I'm, I'm prepared to make myself available for the people coming to see me for what they want. And sometimes people are in a crisis and they, they, they don't want a long-term uh, 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 treatment, but they, they want some immediate help for something. But they decided it. Oh, yeah, they decided it, not me. No, 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 no. That's they, the difference. Yeah, right? yeah. That's the critical difference. Right. Of course. Who decides how long you No, not me. So. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, a really interesting discussion on a very, very important problem. And, you know, there's the cost, there's the time commitment, 
But something of what I feel is that the analysts themselves have been at fault for not educating the public about what analysis is about. And I think it's a serious problem because the popularity of analysis in the 50s and the 60s, that it was in literature, that it was in the movies, that's how people learned uh, subjectively what analysis was. And analysis is not that. I mean, the, the analysis in these areas was used for writing a book, for entertaining people, for making jokes, or whatever. But actually, what analysis is uh, needs to be brought to the university and needs to be brought uh, to everyone, but primarily to young people in ways that, uh, you know, if, if the analysts would spend their energy in helping their profession and teaching by being involved in campus life and having lectures uh, in uh, having maybe a session or two with an analyst in all kinds of ways. They use their enormous amount of creativity in this process to educate America about psychoanalysis. I think it would pull itself out of the problems that it's in. I think the idea of cost and commitment and this, I do think it's a really important uh, place to educate is the people in healthcare or the administrators. I think they really lack the education. They don't know what they're talking about when they talk about psychoanalysis. And when I talk to friends of mine who are interested in psychoanalysis, I can't believe their ignorance uh, that they have ideas that they know all about it. Uh, you know, um, I had a, a very sick husband, and they were talking about should we do CPR if necessary. And I learned my CPR in the movies, so that was my impression. And then when some very, very kind doctor sat down and went through all the process of teamwork of what happens in this procedure, I learned something. And I really feel in analysis there's a whole thing to discuss uh, that is just have no, uh, people just have no knowledge of it. They seem to think the analyst is going to guide them, tell them, advise them, run their life, they're going to give up their autonomy. They don't realize that analysis only works with the both participants, that it's led by the analyst band as to where it's going to go, and it would just change their views to analysis and the there's been a real upsurge in interest in psychoanalysis in the Far East. China in particular, there's, I'm involved in a two-year psychotherapy, psychoanalytic psychotherapy program. <clears throat> and there have been, started out as two years, now four years, because of the intense interest in that. The same is true in Taiwan. Now, how long that's going to last is another issue, but at least at this point, a huge number of young people have gotten interested in it, and there's some support for it in the China Psychological Association, which also has some kind of connection with the government in China. There's also been an increase in the use of psychoanalysis in treating psychotic individuals, I think, also. Offer a comment. Yeah, okay. yeah, one uh, one comment about that. You know, it's it's a very uh, you're right. Um, in many non-Western uh, countries, we see an interest in psychoanalysis. Um, there's going to be a Lacanian meeting in Florida in a couple of weeks, and there's a presenter from China at the meeting. And I'll be very curious to see what uh, this presenter has to say. Um, it, it does seem, though, that psychoanalysis um, really uh, depends on democratic societies to really uh, thrive and, and exist. Um, the, uh, there, there was a, a psychiatrist who was very interested in psychoanalysis in uh, Iran who was um, uh, imprisoned uh, for some period of time, and the French analysts uh, worked uh, very hard and very aggressively to get this psychoanalysts and psychiatrists 
release from prison. This was just a couple of months ago, maybe six months ago. And so um, it, it does seem to me that the experience of those who are um, trying to practice um, uh, psychoanalysis in, in non-democratic countries is it can be very challenging. I actually wanted to take up on that. I think uh, for a psychoanalysis to thrive, there has to be a society that experiences a, a very strong trauma. I think American society lacks trauma. Uh, I come from Buenos Aires. I basically don't know anyone who has not gone to the psychoanalyst for several years. And uh, culturally, if you haven't gone to the psychoanalyst, there's something wrong with you. That's how people see it. <laughs> because you have to, but the thing is, this this is part of a cultural background. There's, like the University of Buenos Aires is a uh, faculty of uh, psychology where 14,000 students study, and most of them are doing psychoanalysis, basically. And there's like several square miles of uh, buildings, several, like 15 to 20 story buildings, where most of the things there are offices of psychoanalysts. And uh, so it's called Freud Town. And, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we had a very strong dictatorship. I think there's a, a, something similar with, uh, with Vienna uh, at the time that Freud is, is working. There's a very tense social moment there. Uh, something similar with some of the European countries where psychoanalysis has thrived. You know, you ask yourself how, how have many, so many people collaborated with a dictatorship or with genociders, with something like that. How, how, how do you deal with a totalitarian state? I mean, the question of the father there and of authority and all of those questions, I think, are, are much more intense in cultures like that. I mean, something that I find is an Argentine who grew up in a very psychoanalytically, psychoanalytically embedded society, you know, I tend to catharsis. The, the way, when I start doing that, Americans think I'm whining. You know, in Argentina, people, the way they see it is, you're opening yourself up and you're recognizing that there's something wrong with you as a person. I mean, I, I think that there's a totally different culture here where people never think of, of themselves as there has to be something wrong with me or with my culture. I mean, the very response to the, the issue of, of, of guns, for instance, and, and all these crazy people that go around killing people, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, what's wrong with the society that does this? Americans don't think that way. They think we need two ways. I have more guns. So if this doesn't happen, or gun control, you know, a very pragmatic response, gun control, if we regulated guns, then this wouldn't happen. But why does something like this happen? What is wrong with us? What is, it like, what is wrong in, in a, a, like, a question with the veterans? What is wrong with a society that sends, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to, 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 to this kind of, of situations where they end up like that. I mean, those kind of questions are, you know, there's like the idea of the self-made man and the American dream that you have to basically shut down all those kind of questions and, and move ahead. And I think that's part of the society that has not experienced trauma. I don't know what, what you think about that. But. I just want to comment. Um, I well, I, because I've been interested in kind of the comparative history of psychoanalysis, why it might be popular in some places at certain times. And the pattern I've noticed is, um, I haven't thought about it so much in terms of trauma, but often when a society is at a point when it's, it seems to be re-envisioning itself, or on the, when it feels like a new social um, organization is possible and eminent, it often will employ psychoanalysis as part of that, um, almost as if you have to kind of re-engineer the inner stuff to create a, a different social world. So I've definitely seen the part that, if you look at the history, it pops up as popular at certain times as the society is optimistic about a new way. So I know that's very abstract, but it's a pattern of I, uh, I'm very interested in your comment. I really like this comment a lot. Um, the, 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 what, what I often hear people speculate is that um, psychoanalysis, or at least Lacanian psychoanalysis, has done better in, in Romance language countries. So, for example, Western Europe, 
um, South America, but not the United States or uh, Germany or Holland, for example, is one explanation that I often see. Or the explanation, and this is very linked to the Romance language hypothesis in countries where the Catholic Church is a stronger presence among religious organizations. Um, I, I've never heard this point about the, tr the history of a, a kind of trauma, you know, social, political trauma within the country uh, itself. I think that's uh, very interesting and it's, it's worth exploring further, so I appreciate that comment. Um, I also appreciate your comment very much because I've been thinking about those questions. What can we as psychoanalysts say about how, what is it about this society that tolerates these kinds of uh, behaviors and, and can't come up with a, a better response than the two you outlined, for example, with guns. Um, and as I've been listening today, I've been thinking more and more about a cultural moment where disavowal is the predominant um, cultural defense. I think it's true with the wars, it's true with guns, and maybe, the, maybe in Argentina, with, whether it's because of the response to the trauma history or something else that disavowal hasn't been able to take hold as much. And maybe with your students, part of what they're it's a disavowal of the inner life and a terror of it um, and, a, and a comfort with this. I mean, both a terror of it and a comfort with disavowing it. So I was just playing with that idea as a, a dominant motif of, of a cultural defense that maybe it's different. And, and why we came to that point, I don't know. Unfortunately, um, I think we have to close, although I, well, let me just like ask for a closing thought. This might be too much to ask uh, for a last minute thing, but, you know, one thing I noticed in the panel was that, um, especially Dr. Gorgachan and, and uh, uh, Katie's paper, is that the, uh, there was this, you know, this sense that, like, now should be the moment for psychoanalysis. Let's take America for the moment. Like, it would seem like we live in a, like, a very psychologistic time where people are constantly talking about psychology, you know, and that, you know, to talk about the society as a whole is much, much rarer in some ways. Um, and we also, you know, live in relativist times where the subject, so the question is, so we would expect psychoanalysis to maybe have this cachet, maybe there's something sort of disturbing about it that doesn't, but what is sort of the insight that you hope, the psychoanalytic insight that you hope can, like, burst on the contemporary scene? Um, that you know you want to see sort of yeah out there. I mean maybe you already Dr. Birchot sort of said it with this culture of disavowal perhaps or but I'm just wondering if all the panelists maybe would take that as like a parting thought like what's the psychoanalytic like how, you know get to the core of the society like the, the pointing the, the poker that would wound um, the self satisfaction. Well I, I guess I said mine but I just would like to add to that. And thanks to all of you who came up with it today, but um, is to be usable. You know, to have an idea not just to wound the self satisfaction, but to be usable to solve social problems. I think if somehow there's more of a crisis in the material basis, more inequality, more poverty, more job loss, more suffering, more disillusionment with the, the pleasures of material acquisition of commodification of everything, that could force people into a corner in which they might see psychoanalysis or the pursuit of the meaning of what's going on in the court. <laughs>
So on an inpatient psychiatric unit, there's a lot of opportunity for injustice, abuse of power, there's such a big power differential. But when we as a staff can talk about what's going on and the enactments that are happening, even if we don't share that with the patients, it actually can make it more a humane place. So I guess that would be my closing thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. More for the recording than anything. I want to just like give a big hand to Greg Abrellis, who is the chairman of the panel. Thank you very much um, for joining us, and uh, please be in touch.